Welcome, viewers, to ThinkTechHawaii.com. The show is The Will of the People, and I am your host, Martha E. Randolph. I first want to thank my friend and colleague, Ian Ross, for hosting the show for a couple of shows because I was absent getting a brand new knee. I would show it to you, but I can't lift my leg that high. Uh, but today, I'm happy to make a comeback with my guest, former Congresswoman Colleen Hanabusa, who was so informative when she was here the last time she appeared on this show that I was determined to bring her back because this woman is a source of great information. And I'm thrilled that she was willing to join us today. Thank you, Colleen, and welcome. Thank you, Martha. OK, now, I'm, I'm not going with the whole introduction because if they don't know who you are by now, go read the <laughs> website. Um, let's start with probably the first question most people would ask, which is now that it is post Congresswoman mm -hmm. time. What are you doing back here? You ran for governor. It You were not offered the option to run. And um, now you're here. I believe you have a legal background. So what are you doing now to prepare f things for the, your future, wherever it's going to go? Well, you know, uh, I've been very fortunate in that uh, I have always been able to go back and practice law. And I've been doing a lot of that. And, and, and I've been doing, um, I represent the legislature, for example. They're in a, a litigation now, so I am uh, their lawyer. I've also done some free work for places like the Bar Association mm -hmm. because they, they need a, a, someone who understands these esoteric points on certain things. And so I've been, I've been keeping busy and, and having a good time, which is the most important part of it. Absolutely. Um, I personally was wondering, how you felt now that you were a congresswoman in a congress that was so overwhelmingly right wing and then you decide to leave and run for governor here and when we talked about it you talked about your ability to do more for the people mm -hmm. of hawaii by being in a place where you actually knew people who could help but now we have a congress where the house is dominated by democrats which would put the party you are part of way ahead and maybe it put you at the head of a number of interesting committees and organizations. How do you feel? Do you still think that that decision was in the best interest of what you can contribute to the country and to Hawaii? Oh yes. And I think, you know, but it always comes down to the voters and how the voters feel. So I may, I may feel that that's uh, putting myself out was the best thing for the people, but the people do decide. And I can live with it because it is the people's decision. Mm -hmm. The Congress, I've made some great relationships. And as you know, before I uh, returned home, I was part of uh, the Nancy Pelosi's leadership team. So many of my colleagues and friends are there, and I still hear from them all the time. And I still keep in contact with them all the time. And you know, uh, being in the majority has different kinds of challenges. Mm. Because the majority, if you look at the majority, you have uh, generational issues now, you have uh, philosophical issues, and with the overlay of the presidential election, you have a whole bunch of different things that they are working their way through. So uh, whether you're in the majority or you're in the minority, politician has to adjust to that which they have to deal with. And you will see, quote, lack of a better description, like growing pains, mm. even with the Democrats. Now, remember now, this Democrat majority is still 22 less than when Nancy Pelosi first became speaker. Right. Yeah. So it's not, I mean, it's, an, it's a nice number, but it's still not as many as she had in 2006. It's true. And also, I believe the number of those newly elected Democrats are part of a more idealistic mm -hmm. and what people refer to as left wing, but I don't think they really understand these terms they use anymore, but more socially aware and wanting things to be better for the majority of the people, sort of anti-industrial um, complex. Yeah. So yeah. we have a bunch of newbies who are enthusiastic and a little aggressive, but which, whose idealism hasn't been there in a while. And that reminds me of the topic we ended on the last time we were talking. We were talking about the way in which money mm -hmm. is collected by the 
D triple C, which I'll ask you to explain to people, right. and how a tithe is assessed of sorts on people according to how mm -hmm. much money they can earn, but how that money, which is then invested in campaigns of other Democratic candidates, is basically not decided on by the people who want to run, and you yourself mm -hmm. were someone who ran without their support. And how is this going to affect the newcomers who may be unwittingly making enemies within the party, but at the same time whom we need for their new blood? Well, you know, one of the, 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 the I guess, the labels that they have come up now is uh, Democrat socialists, right? And that's mm. the, explaining some of the philosophy that's going on. But yes, we have what we call dues. And uh, I've been checking up on what the dues are. So it's tiered. Mm. It's usually tiered by the committees. It's tiered by how many years you're in Congress. And it's also tiered by whether you have a leadership position and how high ranked you are in terms of a committee structure. So right now, because the Democrats are in control, the Democrats will have chairs. And they will have chairs of subcommittees. The value of that is the ability to set an agenda. And so many of my friends are chairs. But some of us were, I was, uh, and, and when you're in the minority, you called a ranking member. So I was always a ranking member in the two, two of the Congresses out of the three that I was in. Mm. So you, you get assessed. What you will find, though, when you are in the majority as they are now, is that a lot of people are more than willing to pay that assessment because they know now that the assessments will be used to either keep Democrats in office or to build more Democrats in the majority. Mm. So when, when you're in the minority and you see the minority position dwindling, some people were very resistant to that. But mm. now I hear instead that people are paying their dues. And their dues are not minimal. I think yeah. a minimal dues now may be around $250,000. Wow. I, yep, $250,000 for, uh, for the, the cycle. Just for the cycle. And this doesn't even include finding a place to live, no. where I understand that many new Congress people are sleeping in their offices because there's no place to go, and if they do find a place to go, it's too expensive anyway. Well, you can't use campaign funds for a place to live anyway. Right. So you have to take it out of your your pay. And Congress, Congress uh, people earn about $174,000 a year, which, which is a nice salary. But what mm -hmm. happens is that they are also doing two households, whatever, especially, especially the ones who have young families and, right. and maybe a spouse who doesn't work uh, but takes care of the, the young babies as they're growing up. Those, they have a real difficult time. And that's why you see, you see them with quote-unquote um, sleeping in their offices. Mm. And, and for people who are, of course, homeless and living on the street, it seems like, well, how can, how can they possibly say that's not enough money? Mm. But for a lot of them, it, they feel that it's not sufficient for them to literally maintain uh, two, two, two homes. However, it, way back when I first got elected in 2010, the Tea Partyites were of the opinion that they did not want to appear like they were part of the Washington infrastructure. So they purposely stayed in their offices so that they would take off right at the end of the week and go home and have no presence. That, by the way, has been a source of criticism by a lot of people who feel that the reason why Washington is so divisive is because of the fact that you no longer have the same PTA meetings to go to, you no longer watch your kids in the Pop Warner football or baseball. Right. You don't have that off-hour kind of collegiality. Mm. And that's one view. The other view is we don't want it anyway. So, you know, it's, it's how do you get to that point? Bipartisanism, uh, being able to reach across the aisle, a lot of that has taken on a different meaning than mm. what it used to have. Yeah. And some people feel that, you know, well, Republicans are quote unquote too far to the right, so we don't want to have anything to do with them. Mm. But some of them feel that we're too far to the left and they don't want to have anything to do with Democrats. Mm. But the truth of the matter is, there's got to be some way for this, in the interest of the country, that people can get together and agree on 
fundamental issues. And the problem is, until you start to talk, you're not going to be able to do that. This is true. There also seems to be a radical difference between what the actual majority of people in the United States want in some cases, mm -hmm. and what they come up against through their politicians is what the people with the high paid lobbyists want. Mm -hmm. uh, gun control leaps to mind, because we just had that incident in New Zealand. Right. And I remember a similar incident in Australia caused the Australian government to immediately buy back guns and put in controls. And they're a nice colonial society. They want people, want their guns to hunt. Somehow they managed it without depriving people of their right to bear arms. Uh, New Zealand's reaction is immediate. Many countries do that. And here in the United States, in spite of repeated incidents and repeated calls by an overwhelmingly majority mm -hmm. of human beings and voters in this country, it doesn't matter. Democrat majority, Republican majority, they always seem to go back to the idea that the Second Amendment means you should have all the weapons you want, regardless of what kind, with minimal controls or regulation. I don't think it's true that, um, that they all feel that way. It, it, it's like, for example, Hawaii's laws on gun control. We are not the most strict in the nation. However, we are also the place that has the least number of deaths as a result of, of arms. Mm -hmm. But when you look at who has the strictest gun laws, they also have a high number of deaths caused by guns, and that's Chicago. Huh. People don't realize that Chicago has the toughest laws. So, for example, we have heard arguments, both on the floor uh, and in caucuses, where people say, you know, you, you're overlooking places like Chicago. It's, like, it's almost like, you know, we don't matter anymore. Because the, the attention, for example, went to Parkland. Remember when Florida, mm -hmm. those, those kids marched on the Capitol, they did all. And some, some believe it's because Parkland was a more affluent community, so they could actually afford to come to Washington and march. I thought actually Shady Hook would have made the difference. Mm -hmm. And that was when you, you had the, the deaths of the young kids. Mm. It didn't. It didn't. No, it didn't. And the question is why? It isn't that Democrats didn't propose it. It's just that at that time we didn't have the majority, so we couldn't get it even on the agenda. Right. The question now is to watch. With the Democrats who have the majority, where and how will they proceed? And I believe you will see gun control legislation actually making its way to the floor, probably passing to the Senate, and we'll have to see what the Senate does. Okay, well, let's stop there for a moment. We have a break coming up. So this is Martha Randolph. The Will of the People is the name of the store. Of, where am I? Ah, it's a show. It's a web pod. There we go. See, when you get a new knee, it affects your brain. But I'll explain <laughs> that to you. And then when we come back for the second half of the show with Colleen Hanabusa. Thank you. Aloha and mabuhai. My name is Emmy Ortega Anderson, inviting you to join us every Tuesday here on Pinoy Power Hawaii with Think Tech Hawaii. We come to your home at 12 noon every Tuesday. We invite you to uh, listen, watch uh, for our mission of empowerment. We aim to enrich, enlighten, educate, entertain, and we hope to empower. Again, maraming salamat po. Mabuhay and aloha. Aloha. I'm Wendy Lowe, and I'm coming to you every other Tuesday at 2 o'clock, live from Think Tech Hawaii. And on our show, we talk about taking your health back. And what does that mean? It means mind, body, and soul. Anything you can do that makes your body healthier and happier is what we're going to be talking about. Whether it's spiritual health, mental health, fascia health, beautiful smile health, whatever it means, Let's take healthy back. Aloha. Show is the will of the people, and I'm happy to have Colleen Hanabusa back with me for a second appearance, and we are having a great discussion about government, which is mm -hmm. something she has been a part of for quite some time, locally and nationally. Uh, we were talking when we went to break about 
um, the gun regulations, which we other nations seem to put through right away, mm -hmm. and how we haven't. But I also wanted to discuss some of the recent events that have shown that there seems to still be a disconnect within the National Democratic Party, and I've discovered recently within the local Democratic Party. Now, Hawaii's situation is different from the nation because we don't really have a competing party. Mm -hmm. uh, within the Democratic Party, we have different camps. That's right. Uh, but they all call themselves Democrats, mm -hmm. and then they all go about doing pretty much what they want, regardless of the platform of the party, as is determined uh, at the state conventions. I don't mean regardless. I mean, in many cases, they simply say, we don't agree with that. We're not going to follow that rule. What do you think the party can do? Because we have an election coming up, a national one. And I am concerned that with this, what do we have, 35 candidates for president, which has never happened, mm -hmm. to my knowledge. Now, they are going to pare down. But let's talk about what the process is, because I think most people don't realize that some of these candidates who are running are running to get their issues on the platform to show mm -hmm. that they have enough support that their issue with it or without them should be part of the party's agenda and then they will drop out because they won't really have enough uh, numbers or they will lend their support to a candidate they feel who follow through so let's tell people a little bit about that process because i don't think many people in the country have ever confronted such a concept. And we don't want Donald Trump to win because the Democrats lost because they offered too many options. You know, that's an interesting point that you raise because the way Hawaii determines who they will support for the presidential candidate is, is a, basically a caucus and mm -hmm. a, a preference poll, presidential yeah. preference poll. What many people who vote in the primary elections in Hawaii, and they usually it's for us, it's determined usually in the primary because it's a it's a democratically controlled state. What they don't realize is that you don't have that choice when it comes to president. That we are a caucus state, and in fact, uh, I was talking to some people who are very active in trying to reform our presidential preference poll, and they were saying that. The, the DNC, the Democratic National Committee, is of the opinion that caucus states should somehow find government, get government to, to actually run it. But government won't pay for a preference poll. So what that leaves it to be is, is okay, how does the party do it? The party has done absolutely a horrendous job, terrible job, in the last two major elections that we had. Yes. Hillary, Obama, and of course, Sanders, Hillary. Hillary. Those were terrible. You had, you didn't have enough ballots. I mean, I stood the Obama election in, in 2008 resulted with, I think, about 38,000 people who showed up to vote. They're not all necessarily registered Democrat, because you can register that day. So people were supposed to register, then cast a ballot. What happened is it got to be so messy, people didn't have ballots, so they take a piece of paper from like your tablet, split it up and say, okay, write who you want and put it in a box. Oh I mean, yeah, no, I, I saw, you saw the that. most recent, uh, in fact, that's how I became involved in the party in 2016. And the chaos was extraordinary and less so in my area than in some others where, where right, they had but that, that's but what still. it is. But it was nothing compared to 2008. We had 5,000 less people, I think, wow. trying to do it. But that's the way. So now they're trying to do something about it. How do you do something about it? You need money. You need, if you're gonna create something like an absentee ballot situation, you need an independent entity to do it. You need people to, to be registered because you know, should you be a Democrat to participate? You should at least register. You can register to vote now for regular elections on the day. So shouldn't there be a process like that which they would have to incorporate? How then do you staff it and who pays? For it all, who pays for the paper, and exactly. so forth. So you know, it's a, it's that, those are the challenges. And uh, what I would like people to understand more than anything else is that it is you have to declare to be a Democrat, whether it's the day or before that, to vote in the presidential preference poll. And it is a preference poll because what happens is that determines 
the number of delegates each of these candidates have when they go to Washington. Absolutely. I mean, well, not Washington, but wherever the convention the, is. The convention year. is. Yeah. Right. And then they, they cast that, the delegates vote. It's like a right. convention vote. So they, that's what people have to realize. So it's not like your vote counts as as a as it would in a election it's mm -hmm. it's your votes adds up and becomes a percentage uh, and a pro rata share and that determines the delegates who go to the convention and then depending on how that shakes out then the whoever it is that you're committed to as mm -hmm. a candidate will then determine if you will cast your vote for that person or you would be released an example is in 2008 I did Hillary Clinton so I was the representative. So when we got to Denver for that election, the question became, okay, the Clinton delegates were then released. And so we went back and we said, you can vote for, you know, we can cast all these votes for Barack Obama. Right. And so that the Hawaii's numbers would look really good for Barack Obama. But you couldn't force anybody. Right. And I still remember this one gentleman I have greatest respect for him, and I don't think he'd mind if I gave you his name, Richard Port. Richard Port said, I am not going to change my vote because, he said, I have waited all my life to cast a vote for a woman, for president, and I'm going to cast that vote for a woman. And he said, and this is probably the last convention I'm going to attend. I had such great respect for him yeah. because he stood by his principles. Yeah. And the rest of us went and said, okay, we'll all vote for Barack Obama. Not that there was anything that we had against Barack Obama or he had against. It was that he waited all his life to vote for a woman, and this was really the last convention he went to, and he cast his vote. So for, to tell people who don't understand, you just said that we have a priority poll mm -hmm. uh, and... A preference poll, a preference excuse me, poll. and that a certain percentage are committed to represent the candidate that a certain percentage of people voted for. But that once they actually get to the convention, don't they have to represent the person that they supposedly are representing? They're not just themselves. It's not their opinion. It shouldn't be. They have been elected or to say all these people voted for Bernie. And so regardless of what I feel, at least on the first ballot, mm -hmm. I'm going to vote for Bernie Sanders because that's what I was asked to do. You could. Or, and, and I, don't, I did not go to that, that, the 2016 convention, but it's up to the candidate. What you are is you go to the state convention first, mm -hmm. and at the state convention, you run as a Bernie delegate or a, a Hillary Clinton delegate. Mm -hmm. And then you go to the national convention, and assuming you can, you have the resources to go, and that's the other thing. Remember, you got to pay your own way. Yeah. You go there, and then you cast your vote. But it's up to the candidate at that point because they then know what the results are, as to whether they say we release you. But it's up to you, and it's up to. Oh, how so the candidate can actually say, "I know you were sent here to vote for, for me, so but I am releasing you for the benefit of the party." Right. To show some, okay, I understand. So that's what happened with the Clinton delegates in 2008. Right. They released the, but that's my story about my friend Richard Port, who said, no, I, I've waited all my life to vote for a woman. I'm not going to come to another convention. I got to vote for a woman. Right. And he cast his vote. So we had all the votes for Barack Obama except for one. Mm -hmm. and, and I have the greatest respect for him because he stood by. Right. And if others wanted to do it, I would have, I would have cast the votes and say, you know, for Hawaii, we had X number for Barack Obama, X number for, for Hillary Clinton at that right. time. Bernie Sanders, uh, you're right about the, the position on the platform. Mm. I represented the, the Clinton campaign in 2016 in Orlando where we worked on the platform. Usually, and this is what happened in 2008, the, um, Hillary Clinton's position was, you know what? Barack Obama is the president. He should have his platform going forward. The Bernie Sanders people felt that they had important issues to do. So they did. They stood yeah. by their guns. And you know what? The Democratic platform incorporated what they felt. Mm. So recently, 
Bernie was, when he announced that he was running for president, he made an interesting comment. He says, I am now a mainstream Democrat because so much of what I believe in is in the platform. He's absolutely true. They were in the platform right? because people supported it. And, and so do you think this is influencing the incredibly large number of people who are running? Because we've seen certain issues pop up that are being introduced and then jumped on by five or six different mm -hmm. candidates who are saying, we care about this issue. Like, now, for example, a lot free of education. Free right. education. Um, Medicare for all, mm -hmm. which mm -hmm. I think is problematic, but mm -hmm. still, that's a big issue. Free education is a big issue. Um, there are, oh, uh, remove the electoral college, right. which I think some people don't realize how much more difficult that would be because that would require changing constitution. the constitution. Right. Uh, but there might be some new rules added to the limitations of electoral college. Who may be a member of that so that and how they have to conduct themselves maybe on a all 52 states basis as opposed to each state making its own rules. But I would like to think that we would we we're principled and that's what happened. Mm. But Martha, I, I got to tell you, I think a lot of this is a reaction to Donald Trump. It More, is. The, the positions that people are taking are as a relaxed reaction to Donald Trump. Donald Trump is probably single-handedly, we were going to have a campaign manager for us Democrats to get the, our base kind of energized. Mm. We should hire Donald Trump. I think he's done an excellent job because people are so angry at what he is, mm -hmm. what he stands for, and cannot believe that this is the America that we have all come to respect and love, and somehow he, this, this, this person has single-handedly wiped it off the map. Yeah, he has. Mm -hmm. um, I do have some concerns because in Hawaii, I have to wrap up slowly, mm -hmm. but we have a divide in our party here in Hawaii, which is still based on the Bernie Sanders versus Hillary Clinton actions of 2016. We are now in 2019. We're moving to 2020. Basically, it is a hierarchical, long-term democratic activists in the party versus newcomers who were activated by their enthusiasm for Bernie Sanders. And the irony is the people who are longtime servers will complain that nobody wants to do the work and we've been doing the work. And so, you know, that's why we're here. But they're not really willing to let the other people come in and do the work they are saying, teach me, I will do it. There is an interesting conundrum here. And I think it's affecting the Democratic Party of Hawaii. And I think something similar may happen nationally, and I was wondering what you think about that. Can the party stop dividing itself, look at real issues, and get the enthusiastic newcomers together with the old-timers, and have the old-timers open up to their ideas, but at the same time show them why certain things have to maybe be prolonged over a longer period of time to get them accomplished? Don't try to shove your great cake down the throat of the American people because they're not ready. Feed them in little bits until they're ready to open up wide. So that's I, a strange I think analogy. I've, I've, watched, I've watched recently people try to do exactly what you're saying. But it is an individual basis. It mm -hmm. is how a person acts. So I have a, 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 a friend, and uh, she's retired. And she's getting together a bunch of young millennials who are, and they're, they're running as a slate to, to run for, um, I think in this particular case, they're going to look first at the Oahu County and they're going to they're gonna set themselves up. But they are working together. And she's saying to me, it's amazing to hear them and what they have to say. But they're not, it's not a divide on quote unquote Hillary and Bernie. It is a divide more on generational divide. Okay. But it is reaching out, and, it is, and they've, they've transcended the Bernie, quote, Hillary issue. And it's more a matter of what is the future of this party? What does it mean to be a Democrat? Mm. What, should there be something that defines you as a Democrat? Should Absolutely. there be fundamental rules? And these are the things that they are looking at. So it's going to happen. But Martha, it's going to happen individually. It's going to be you reaching out to some young student or someone and saying, hey, 
come with me to the party and let's try and work this out. Which is really why this show came into being, which mm -hmm. is to reach out to people and say, look, this is how it works. And if you want to do something about it, here are some of the things you can do, and here are the places you can go to get information on how to participate. So I'm going to wrap this one up. Of course, I'm ready to go for the third session. Let's <laughs> book another one. But thank you, Colleen. You're very As welcome, always, Michael. you've been extremely informative. If you do teach another class at UH, please let me know. I will announce it to everybody because <laughs> I am signing up for that one. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Martha Randolph. The show has been The Will of the People. My guest was Colleen Hanabusa. And I can't begin to give you a title for this show because we went everywhere. Thank you very much, and I'll see you in two weeks. <laughs>